Hang on a second. I say we can probably go now. Start a little rough, but that's okay. That's normal. <laughs> that's what we do. <laughs> for me. Okay. Ah, well, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to our Sunday night offering of Astronomy Outreach for um what are we, May the 28th? Sure. Sunday night astronomy show. Yay! Yay! Tim? <laughs> Yay! Tim? Hey, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> hey. <laughs> now uh, just tell me so. Okay, you got to follow along. Uh, have you not seen the show before? Have you not seen the show before or what? <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Chris Kerwin. I'm your host this evening and creator of the social media channels known as Astronomy by the Bay. Uh, I'm an amateur astronomer and member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Yay! Yay! Why do you get James Taylor on your shirt then? I said a member of. I'm also a member of this fan club. Oh, always, I thought, I thought always you were been. James Taylor. Always I'm been, always will be. To tell. James Taylor hat. fan club. <laughs> Not gonna deny it. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome back our two brother co-hosts of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, Mr. Paul Owen from the Moonshadow Observatory in beautiful Hampton, NB. Paul, good evening. Hello, 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 hello. Hey. I'm down there somewhere. <laughs> uh, and also our rather regular co-host here on the program, Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory here in St. John. Beautiful. Uh, yeah. beautiful. Hey, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Made it back. Thanks, <laughs> Mike, episode of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show. Tonight, we're inviting our friend Tim Doucet back to the program. Welcome, Tim. Hey! 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, Tim is an amateur astronomer and a member of the Halifax RAS Center. Uh, he lives under the dark skies of Quinn in Nova Scotia, which we all want to visit very soon, um, where he operates a wonderful dark sky tourist destination known as Deep Sky Eye Observatory. Now, Tim has recently just completed starring in the documentary that focuses on his challenges of being a legally blind astronomer and all of his subsequent achievements. Well, this documentary is to be released soon, so he'll we'll, be sharing some details and a wonderful opportunity with us tonight. Also on tonight's show, uh, Mike will be offering another vinyl bud treasure to enjoy. Uh, Paul will give us another interesting Rosanna's fun fact uh, to share for, with us. Um, I'll have a quick look at what to watch for in this week's sky. We'll talk a little bit more about our Shoot the Moon contest uh, that's on active right now. Getting lots of kids' entries so far, all kinds of really fun kids', kids entries. Yeah, really yeah. enjoying that. Yeah. Uh, so, anyway, we'll talk about that a little bit and say we have some uh, wonderful photo submissions to share as well. So, uh, this is a family friendly, interactive live broadcast, as Dan says, the Sunday night comedy astronomy show. That's what you <laughs> <do>. <laughs> um, so, for those of you joining us from my YouTube channel or Facebook page, we are happy to try to answer all of your astronomy questions here in real time as well. And, of course, we'd like to welcome back all of those who have been joining us through the local Rogers TV network. Thank you for your support. Yay. Okay, so let's get started with tonight's program and a uh, discussion around Tim's recent documentary and his plans for the season. Tim. Hey, well, thanks, doing, buddy? thanks a lot again for uh, for having me on the show. Always and, a pleasure. Uh, yeah, so I've had uh, I've had quite an experience. Um, 
this look, last year, the a lady from the Belfe Production in Moncton, um, Melanie Leger, had contacted me and said, you know, we we saw a, a film on you back uh, on AMI TV, which is accessibility accessibility media incorporated, I believe, and they have basically had a little. We had a little a little production, probably like a five minute, you know. Uh, interview with them and it was quite interesting but they wanted to do a full like one hour documentary and I was like oh uh, and I said well how much time are you going to need to do this like I got a you know I got a week or so or whatever oh it'll probably take a month and uh, you know between two weeks at your place actually and you know with all the other stuff I'm like oh boy okay so I, I agreed to it after a little bit and uh you know, they said this was a, you know, this was a fairly large production and, and whatnot. So, well, let me just tell you, we moved, we went to different places. Um, I've got a few photos I can show you from where we, where we started. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I'll That's share, great. I'll share my <laughs> screen. At least I will try to share my screen. If anybody has any questions and stuff, just, uh, just interrupt me and I'll, I'll try to answer them. So. Let's try and see what this will do. There, yeah, there you go. There you go. Good start. A full screen. Can you see that? Yeah. 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 So the first place they took us, uh, well, took me actually. In this case, we uh, I went to uh, the. Of course, we went to Moncton. But uh, prior to stop to Moncton, we went to the fun day. St. John Astronomy Club's uh, <laughs> <stages thing. laughs> That's Comedy Central right there. There you go. Central right there. It was uh, it was absolutely amazing. We had a uh, I hadn't been to a star party in almost ten years, and I just couldn't believe. I'm like, okay, now we have to get back into star parties. Right we spent a couple of days with you guys. We filmed for like the two days. We filmed the, kind of in different places and such. Of course, met my old. It was meant to be as a kind of reunion for me, and I I felt that because in Moncton it was my friend, you know, my friends from Moncton, Emma, June, uh, Charles, that really kind of helped me out with astronomy and and really kind of got me into it. So um, it was awesome, and uh, you know, thank you guys for having that because that to me was that was like one of the top highlights for me was for the whole documentary. So we went to Moncton. Um, in Moncton, we filmed at the at the observatory because that's where I sort of met Charles, uh, Charles Doucette. And, uh, you know, did a lot of, you know, spent a lot of time in Moncton at the time doing, and of course, in Fredericton and St. John doing astronomy for the years. So I have a lot of friends there. And so then once we came back from Moncton and we had started filming at our place uh, a few weeks later, it was delayed a couple of weeks because I had COVID, uh, not because of the star party, but uh, unfortunately uh, my son brought it home. So uh, <laughs> not by his own, you know, not by his fault or anything, but uh, so we started filming at our place and it was uh, two weeks, uh, two weeks of filming there. Um, they filmed everywhere from my office. Uh, we visited the Shag Harbor UFO festival, uh, UFO festival, UFO uh site if you will and uh did a little bit of filming there so that was pretty fun did you have any settings no not that time oh so, no no i actually i missed the picture i was going to show you the picture of the lobster they have down there it's actually pretty awesome it's uh it's painted and it's like a statue type of thing and it's got <laughs> dark stuff on it and alien <laughs> stuff it's really cool actually awesome and it's actually in some cases like there's like they have like the north the north, uh, you know, pointing in the north, which is the correct location and everything. So a little bit of astronomy in there too. I, I forgot <laughs> to put it in there. It was pretty fun. I don't know if people realize, but that Shag Harbor is like the uh, Roswell of Canada. It is. It's actually the only government, like government documented um, UFO sighting in the world. Really? Uh, like wow. really yeah followed yeah it's it's quite uh it's quite a thing yeah and recently they recently they haven't uncovered anything with the you know with the uh, the ufo but 
they uncovered a part of an old, uh, what they think might be a pirate ship or something that the, the, during the last uh, hurricane last year or the year before washed up ashore and, and uncovered from one of the beaches down there. So it's, oh. they've got all this wood that's actually incredibly still intact and they're guessing it might be something around the 1600s. So, so right. yeah. Cool. yeah. So we did some more filming here at the observatory, of course, did um, several nights. We had some clear nights, which was really cool. Uh, that's uh, Melanie and Jill doing some astrophotography with my uh, nine and a quarter inch telescope and had their camera. I hooked their camera up to it for them. And we did some more filming, of course, around the area um, our, in our site here. So this is kind of like the camping, uh, the fire pit by the river that we have. So if you guys uh, happen to come down, you get a chance to sit around the campfire too and enjoy some, uh, enjoy some kayaking if you want, or, you know, hey, get your license and do some fishing if you want. Might yeah. catch a few. <laughs> or a pickerel for sure. We invited them for uh, Thanksgiving dinner and uh, we had a great time with them. So our family was very open to having them. We got along very well. and. It was nice to have some company. That's so, nice. Yeah, we are very fortunate. They were actually quite pleased. They, they weren't expecting that at all. So for them, it was very, uh, it, it was very good. It really got a chance to get to know us. Hooked up a solar filter um, to one of our little, tele to his camera actually. And uh, he just wanted to take a couple of pictures of the sun with his, with his camera there. So we had a glass, uh, glass filter and uh, I told her just, don't move the filter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they got a chance to use the big scope. Um, we have a, a white light solar filter for it. So uh, had a really cool time. Um, and I got some pretty cool uh, footage of them. They were playing around. And when they had the camera hooked up, it was funny because they, they kind of said it looked like the Death Star passing through the clouds. <laughs> <laughs> they were doing the, the the song theme theme song and everything. Awesome. We had a group from um, College Saint Anne from the French community um, college up here, and uh, had a whole bunch of those folks come down and they filmed the whole thing and you know did the uh, we did the experience uh, despite clouds rolling in fairly quickly, of course, uh, as you might sometimes as it sometimes happens. But we had a fun, pretty fun time with them. Um, we also went to different areas, locations in Yarmouth. We went to the Cape Forshoe Lighthouse. And uh, one of the activities now at Cape Forshoe is to, you can actually climb up the, uh, climb up the lighthouse and go to the top. Oh. Oh. Yeah, it's a, it's a tourism attraction now, so. No, sir. Yeah, it's well worth it. It's a lot of fun. That's, that's the view from up there, is it, Tim? It is, yeah. I was up there, I took a picture. Um, you have to make sure you're not too claustrophobic or afraid of heights. Um, the staircase is, is fairly narrow and it's like you can see down through it because it's just great. Mm -hmm. So uh, not everybody could make it up there. <laughs> you can see what it looks like. That's going oh, yeah. Up. yeah. Was it hot? Up? Was it hot up there? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was quite hot. And this was in October. Yeah. Okay. We also did a, a filming of, uh, I was doing the, the presentation that I do for the Counting Stars project. And um, got all the students there to create these little picture frames. And wow. they are uh, going back to their homes and doing a um, you know star counting thing. And we're waiting to get back some results. This, this fall, we're gonna be doing, um, we're having our Starlight Festival again this year, finally, since 2019, it hasn't happened. But one of the projects that we're getting the students and all the schools to do is this Counting Stars project and uh, log all their data with our website. And then during the, during the Starlight Festival, we're having a star party. Um, we're actually having three star parties to match. Um, the three star parties are going to be in each municipality, and we're going to live stream them to each other um, and share the results and, and do all kinds of fun stuff with the kids. So nice. um, it's a fun community science project. It involves the schools and the parents and everybody. So it, it, I'm hoping for a, a good success with that. 
And I went to see my eye doctor and ended up with two eye exams, one with a mask, one without. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, we have to do this twice. I'm like, oh, not twice. I said, does that mean I don't have to see you for two years? (laughs) Had a good chuckle. They kind of showed off a little bit of a collection of my t-shirts. Oh, awesome. Oh. That'll be part of the documentary too. I think they're doing some funny stuff with that. All right. Now. That's my office. We did a little bit of a, uh, quite a bit of filming there. And um, so while we were in Moncton. Hey, I recognize that clock. That is, I was going to ask if you're going to recognize that clock. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> thank oh. you, Paul. Oh, yeah, thank you. I'm glad you're still, like, glad it's still working. Yeah. Oh, it stopped years ago. <laughs> it started working again after I unbent the uh, unbent the alarm. A little alarm, yeah. <laughs> but uh, fantastic. So while we were uh, while we were in Moncton, um, we met with the film with the uh, owners of Belfe Production, and uh, we had an interesting discussion about um, an interesting discussion about you know, all these things that we were going to do. So one of the things they wanted us to do, they were going to do is we were going to, they were going to take us to Toronto uh, at the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's uh, headquarters. And um, in a couple of other places. So Amanda and I actually met in, in Ontario. Um, She's from New Brunswick. I'm from Nova Scotia, but you know, 30 years ago, we met uh, at a camp for the visually impaired uh, called the Score Camp, and it was sponsored by Wayne Gretzky's um, Wayne Gretzky family. Oh, wow. so, um, that's where we met, and it was really fun because we. Uh, oh, it was fun because we got a chance to. We didn't visit the exact place where we met, but you know, one of the places that we actually had been to was the CN Tower. So that was you know kind of fun. They took us up to the CN Tower. Um, we went around Toronto and took pictures in different places. So it was pretty fun. Um, we also went to the, the Rask Center, um, the headquarters there, and did an interview with, um, I did an interview with uh, Dr. Ralph Shu, Shu, who was the leading, he was, a uh, you know, sort of the, one of the leading optometrist, uh, ophthalmologist, um, instructors of the University of Toronto. So it was really cool. He, I had connected with him years ago uh, to try to find out what was wrong with my eyes. Um, why do I see ultraviolet light? Why am I seeing this kind of thing? And he was able to, you know, tell me what was going on. And um, so anyway, they interviewed him and uh, we went around and, uh, you know, did a sort of a tour of the facility and everything, look at all the telescopes and, and um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. So. Then, so while we were in, so yeah, while we were in Moncton, had a discussion again with the, um, with the folks that own Belfe Production, uh, Oana and Jean-Claude. And we had gotten to chat about Hawaii and I don't remember exactly how it come up now. It was something to do with him. Him and his, um, his wife had gone to, uh, to Hawaii for their anniversary. And I said, well, yeah. So Amanda and I, is, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year, but we celebrated, but we didn't celebrate it because, you know, we kind of hadn't had, uh, we haven't had time. We've been so busy. And, you know, I said, I'd love to visit Hawaii. I said, that, that, that's like top of my list. I said, uh, you know, I'd love to visit there because the Canada, France, Hawaii telescopes and, and um, the Mauna Kea observatories up there. And, uh, so, you know, since I was a kid, you know, um, that's the can of France wide telescope was, was a cool thing for me. And, uh, you know, being built or started the year I was born in 1973 and going into operation in 19, I think it was 1978. So by the eighties, you know, when telescopes and stuff, it was like the big observatory. So anyhow, I get a message from them after we get back from Moncton on that Monday and they're like, yeah, Melanie's like, Hey, yeah. Um, they're actually very keen on uh, sending you to Hawaii and uh, doing the filming there. I'm like, oh, wow. okay, <laughs> that would be fun. I, I didn't really kind of take it too seriously. And then 
you know, they started talking more about it and it, one thing led to another. And next thing you know, I was in a Zoom meeting with the director of, uh, of the Canada France Hawaii Telescope's uh, outreach coordinator and uh, Mary Beth. And, uh, you know, then next thing it was, you know, you're invited to officially come to the Canada France Hawaii Telescope and, uh, you know, um, and film there. So I was pumped up. I was so excited. Nice. So I had some quick gear to get ready. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, I can't, I have to have a backup camera. Uh, so I borrowed my friend's camera. I borrowed some gear from my friend, uh, Brenda, and, uh, you know, purchased a few little other things, uh, you know, that I didn't know what I was going to be able to use, what I was going to be able to do. But I said, if one thing, I need to get a time lapse of, you know, up on top of the mountain, if I can make it up there. Anyhow, believe it or not, packed it all in one suitcase. And off we went in yeah. April, a few weeks ago. Um, back at early April, or April 12th, we left. You can have the shirt to take with you. I had the show. Oh, I was ready, man. I had the oh, yeah. I had the, <laughs> yeah, I had the shirt, the sunscreen, and there was one thing that I forgot. And I, I, I kicked myself because... I had said, uh, I sent a message from Mary Lou Whitehorn and, um, and Dave Lane and they're like, oh yeah, we went there and, and we had this little sign that we made that, you know, that said, um, you know, Mauna Kea Observatory, uh, uh, what was it, Halifax Center, I can't remember what it was, or it was the, the observatory from Halifax, but, so, I went and got one of these made. I don't know if you can see my. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There you go. Oh, wow. Awesome. <laughs> nice, eh? And oh, totally yeah. forgot it home when I packed. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's how excited I was. <laughs> I got home and I found it and I'm like, oh my God, I totally forgot this. So, yeah, we made it. It was a very long trip. I would do it again in a heartbeat. Love Hawaii. Um, you know, total of about 16 hours of traveling, uh, 12, 13 hours on the plane, um, a couple of hops, but we made it to Waimea on Big Island. And it was very interesting because when we got to the airport, it was about 24, 25 degrees. When we got to Waimea, it was like 13, 14, 15 degrees maybe. And it was cloudy. So I was kind of like, hmm, where's all the good stuff? Um, on our way in, actually, we passed by one of the larger islands, uh, another one of the islands of Hawaii. And I don't know which one this is, but it's one of them. I haven't had a chance to look at the thing there yet, but you see a couple of islands there. Um, there's five, five or six islands now in the Hawaii sort of line of islands. And uh, there was a new one that popped up recently. It's a very active place. It's all volcano-based, right? So everything's been created and destroyed by volcanoes. Mm. Anyway, after a first day of rest, we went to the CFHD headquarter, or, uh, headquarters, yeah, um, control center. Um, this is where the telescopes and stuff are operated from um, in Waimea. So we're only about probably, I think it was around 4,000 feet up there. So uh, it's the facilities right in the town. Um, and uh, this is Nadine Monset from Quebec, who uh, was very kind in arranging everything and uh, actually getting me some time on the telescope as well. So, oh, nice. yeah, was, was pretty excited. So we went around, um, and uh, she, yeah, it was. We she gave us a tour of the facility, and um, whoops, I've got lots of stuff about that, but uh, another time. So. Anyways, um, this is uh, another one of the volcanoes, uh, Mount Kilauea. And this is the one that erupted back uh, in November. No, this one was, uh, yeah, I think it was in November, where it actually erupted. It doesn't erupt. Volcanoes from there are not erupting, like exploding, if you will. They're more, um, there's like slow moving lava everywhere. And the lava that comes up, generally doesn't always fill the crater at the top, but comes up the side of the mountains. So it's kind of a little bit easier to predict what's happening once 
the lava starts flowing, it's basically get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the landscape is very different in this area. This is the there's 11 different climate zones and you'll see what I mean. I've got to think another picture of the other side of the island. This is sort of the dry side with the beaches and the nice weather. And like the other side is like, it's like a uh, rainforest. It's, it's amazing. Hmm. So next night after third night, we were there. Um, I went to the facility again and spent about two to three hours. I think we were there um, controlling the telescope. And uh, that's Mary Beth, the director on the left, uh, and Helen on the right. She's the remote observer at the time. Uh, so she controls the, you know, watches the telescope at night, make sure everything gets, uh, make sure all the runs get done for all the astronomers that want photos that night. Mm -hmm. Then the next day we started up the mountain to go to the actual observatory to look at the, uh, look at the telescope. We got to the top of, the, we got halfway to the visitor center, which is at about 9,000 feet. Um, when we left, it was beautiful and sunny. When we got there, it was pouring rain storm. Uh -huh. And the road oh. had to be closed. Oh. Um, when we left at the bottom of the mountain, it was almost 30 degrees Celsius. When we got here, it was seven. And at the top of the mountain, they're saying it was about minus two. So it's very good that very close that there would be ice on the road. Wow. So then we had to close the road. They had to close the road. And we waited there for about two hours, two and a half hours. And just you have to stay there for at least half an hour minimum to get your body acclimatized to low oxygen. Mm -hmm. And I found that was the biggest challenge for me um, because I have anxiety disorder my for some reason my body was hyperventilating and if if i i controlled it it took me by the time i got to the top the next day it took a little bit it took about half an hour it took about an hour and a half for me to actually get accustomed to the feeling like shit because yeah. when you go up there you feel like shit and they basically mary beth was incredible because she knew exactly how to explain to you how you were going to feel and that it was okay, like we have oxygen, you're not gonna die kind of thing and all that kind of stuff. Um, and to really get, you know, make you accustomed to the warning signs of what could happen. Wow. So the next day, uh, actually the next day we made it up there um, at 14,000 feet, 14, 000, just under 14,000 feet. Wow, that's almost three miles. Yeah, and that's it was quite an adventure just getting up there. Wow. Um, they won't let you kind of go up there unless you've got a full tank of gas and you've also got uh, a four by four Jeep. The road is not paved all the way up there. How um, long did it take it up, Tim? It's about from the visitor center, about half an hour. Okay. Yeah. So about an hour, an hour or so total time to get up there. Wow, that's what it's like up there. That's what it's like. That's where we were. So those are the uh, some other telescopes that are there. There's about I think there's 13 telescopes there now. Look, Mom, Disneyland. Yeah, <laughs> <That's> amazing. <laughs> and like we had just gotten above the clouds, and there was still a little bit of fog and stuff. But after after um, you know, once the sun started setting, everything just cleared up, and it was. We were allowed to stay up there. We weren't allowed to stargaze up there. So when you're up there, when you're up there, um, you have to leave about half an hour to 45 minutes after sunset um, because the dust from the vehicles will disturb the instruments in the telescopes. Oh, we're allowed to stargaze for that reason? Is that the reason you mean? Or Yeah, that's the reason, yeah. So we stayed and we saw like a few of the stars starting to poke out and everything. And it was like, it's like they weren't even, it was like, they weren't even there. You know how here they flicker? Mm. Yeah. They were just solid. There was just like no movement. Like it's like one of those so clear nights that, you know, nothing moves. Yeah. Yeah. That's and why they use the larger instruments, eh? Because they're just, just the uh, imaging, uh, what do they call that? The, um, the scene is so oh. unbelievable. It is, yeah. 
And I, I wished we could have stayed longer, but it, un unless you actually are an astronomer and you actually have the capability to stay there, it's, it's kind of a challenge, so. That's unbelievable. Wow. Um, on our way up, one of the things that was interesting is we heard this kabang. We almost got to the top and we heard this bang and everybody was like, oh shit. And this was sort of the, this was the, the night, the, the first night we had gone in there. And uh, they thought it was a water bottle that had exploded, but it turned out it was a bag of chips that exploded. <laughs> <laughs> This is my bag of chips, and it was <laughs> Cheetos, no less. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Because there's um, forty percent less oxygen and air pressure up there, so I think a normal KPA pressure around here is like between uh, nine hundred to like twelve hundred or something like that. Mm -hmm. And up there, it was like four to five hundred. So. Yeah, your body swells, like your your hands and stuff feel like swollen a bit. And uh, it, it's a strange feeling. And while we were there setting up our gear to do time lapses, um, we were doing time lapses. We had our, tels our stuff set up over there. And I was setting up and I, I had one of the cameras and I, was tr I had three cameras I was going to set up. And then I decided last minute, I'm just going to leave one because they told us that this, like, People do still kind of sometimes go up there and sometimes stuff goes missing. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we didn't want to lose a, a camera. One of our, one of the film crew had his GoPro sto stolen at the, uh, in Waimea, um, like within minutes of setting it up for a time lapse outside. Um, but anyways, I was setting up the gear and all of a sudden I, I uh, set everything up and, and one of the guys said, hey, wait a minute. Didn't you say you had a dew heater? I'm like, oh, yeah, forgot to put that on. So <laughs> put that on. Um, the interesting thing was is um, they were kind of doing stuff that was a little bit odd, too. Like they weren't, they weren't thinking about it. But the, the next day, we had asked Mary Beth, like, does being up here make you stupid? <laughs> that was his question. She said, absolutely, it does. Uh, after a, a, a given amount of time, your brain's not functioning exactly the same way. Um, and you'll forget things, you'll, you'll do silly <laughs> things. I had actually did something silly too. I had forgot, I put the wrong battery in the camera and I didn't get the full all night time-lapse uh, video that I was hoping to get, but I got it. Really good. And uh, hopefully you'll, if you get a chance to watch the documentary, you'll get a chance to see it. So the next day we dropped, so we dropped our gear off this at night here and then we, headed back down. And uh, in the morning, we went back to the, to the mountain. And um, that's me sitting, uh, standing underneath the telescope with all the gear attached to it. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's big. It's a uh, 3.6 meter mirror. Um, and the whole thing stands about six, seven stories high. Um, I think the observatory is eight stories in total. It's uh, it's it's absolutely massive. Um, is it like a Richie Gretchen design? It's it's uh, it's got no. I think it's more of it's like a Newtonian, but I think it's got some sort of photo that optic in there. Oh, okay. Coming back down, it's and uh, you can see this giant counterweight. And I'll show you a, a picture after here. So it was amazing to watch and to see like the whole thing moving and stuff. It was, it was pretty cool. So this was the daytime shots we took of some of the observatories there. That's our group. And that was it for the filming. Um, we got the we got the crew some t shirts. Um, you might have seen them. We've got the t shirts with the uh, oh, with the with the little uh, palm trees and such on oh, there, yeah. <laughs> and of course after the crew left, Amanda and I stayed for a few uh, for a couple of weeks almost there, and uh, we did some fun stuff like parasailing, uh, snorkeling with the manta rays, um, 
did a bunch of snorkeling and it was it was pretty awesome it was an amazing place to do all that stuff didn't do any surfing wasn't really too keen the the waves are much like we've been to cuba many times um but the pacific ocean waves are quite um quite more dangerous i will i would say um you know it's uh the waves can pull you down and, and move you around a bit so if i would have had somebody that was with me i would have also gone snorkeling on my own but we just decided to do the tours instead and, and leave it at that yeah keep safe yeah yeah because it's it's it can be dangerous it's dangerous for the average the normal person with normal eyesight so you know having bad eyesight i wasn't ready to, to yeah. jump that. so um when we got back i got the data from the canada france hawaii telescope um and it was about a, a week or so a week or so afterward and uh i went to process the data and the images were absolutely huge um the camera they use is called the uh, mega cam it takes a picture of one degree of sky it has 40 ccd sensors oh <laughs> So the images are about 2,400, um, sorry, 24,000 pixels by uh, 40,000 pixels. Oh, no, 24,000 by 20,000 pixels. So you're looking at about 500 megapixel camera in total. Yeah. So do you have to process it like each individual image that you got from each sensor or how does that work? Yeah, I'm working on it. What it is, it's very different than what I'm used to and what we're used to as amateur astronomers. Um, these are called mosaic cameras. Mm -hmm. So the data is all compacted into one FITS file. And that FITS file has 40 images in it, plus all the other images that, that are attached with it. Mm -hmm. So you have to run it through some processing algorithms to uh, one of the pieces of software is called... Um, uh, what's it called? Anyway, lost my train of thought, but as far as the, what it was called, but I can't remember, but it's, it's an interesting, it's a sort of a free piece of software you can download. And what it does is it basically lets you take a mosaic image and project it onto any sort of plane that you want. So if you want a 2D by 2D, or if you want a spherical plane or whatever. Um, so anyways, I, I loaded it up. I've never even thought about it. And I've got 16 gigs on my Mac, my, my Mac mini. It's older. It's like 2010 or 2012. But anyway, when I first loaded up the image and tried to process it using PixInsight after I had added the images together, um, my Mac just did this and died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> it crashed and burned real hard. <laughs> I've never seen that ever happen on, a, on my Mac ever. Wow. So um, I loaded up finally on my PC just to see what it kind of looked like. And um, the image I took was M51. And so all of those individual things we're looking at, were they the individual sensors? Yes. So, so your M51 fit on one sensor? On one sensor, yeah. OK. And it's actually quite amazing how how many galaxies that we that was I was able to to get? I don't know what's going on with this thing. Um, oh, I know what's going on. It's just misbehaving. Um, it's just because the picture is huge. I, I forgot to scale it down. Um, so yeah, it's amazing how many galaxies we actually picked up. And once I'm finished the processing of this image, and there's more than one, we took a few shots. I'm just gonna scroll down here. Like these fuzzy patches here, like these are all galaxies, like. Wow. I don't know why it won't let me zoom out, but hey. These are just hot pixels. So some of the, like, I haven't gone through and done the, the subtraction and all that stuff yet. Mm -hmm. But we'll be doing it soon. It must be pretty um, amazing just to look at that, all that data besides M51, because for us, M51 would be the jewel in it. But for them, I guess it's all about research. And this is all research grade uh, yeah. uh, instrumentation, huh? Yeah. It's, um, it's just unbelievable. <laughs> it's mind boggling. Yeah, it's, it's crazy how, 
how much. I'm trying to zoom in, but it won't let me. And like I said, I forgot to scale the image back and it's freaking out. Um, <laughs> um, Lightroom, I think, is giving. And this is just, so we had three different filters. Um, we had red, green, luminance, I think. Um, and we were imaging with those three filters. Um, oh, by the way, just to give you an idea, this shot is uh, 40 seconds. Really? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> 40 seconds. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the image that I have here once I'm finished processing it and probably grab some more data from, from the CFHD because it's, uh, it's available. Um, my data is not available to anybody uh, for a year because I have rights to it. Any astronomer that has the right, like has the rights, it's basically there for, uh, for a year. Then you can actually go, there's a site that you can go to and I was going to bring it up, but uh, I didn't have a time to, to load it up. But um, when you go to the site, you can actually see all the runs that the telescope has done. It, it's a Canadian site. It's part of the Canadian government's uh, astronomy program. And you can go in there and look. And uh, I was there poking around just to see if, if my run had gone in there. And uh, when you go down and you look, you actually see, you know, Dr. Tim Doucette, I kind of laughed. I chuckled. <laughs> so um, I'm permanently engraved in the data archives of the CFHD. Oh, awesome. that's awesome. awesome. There's a single frame from the time lapse I took well, I was, awesome. uh, that I let the camera run. Wow, look at that sky. It's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. And you know, the clouds are awesome there because they actually block the light pollution. Right on. Yeah. Oh, they smother it. Okay. Yeah. Like you can see a little, a little bit down here. Um, you know, there's, and it's interesting too. Like I've got lots of photos of, of the area that where we stayed and such and how, um, how they've actually, you know, using amber lighting, LED lighting. And it's incredible. It's like, it's just, uh, I just want to live there, you know, like the yeah. parking lots, the, the streets and, and all that. It's just, yeah. Really awesome. So yeah, that's yeah, essentially. Yeah. It. Um, we we visited a couple of places while we were there. The Black Sand Beach. Um, it's quite interesting. It's lava, um, lava sand. Um, and uh, one of the things I was pretty excited when I first thought of it. it you know, it's always a good good idea to research the places where you go, and I normally do, and and whatnot. And I was looking at you know flying my drone and all this kind of stuff, and I wanted to bring back some some lava rock. I thought this would be cool. I'll bring back a piece of lava rock and, you know, you know, kind of say that I've been to Hawaii and all that. Well, apparently there's a quite a very strong belief there that um, the the goddess Pele, which is the goddess of fire, who's responsible for the volcanoes, essentially, um, they believe that this is the, that the lava rock is part of her. And she will get very upset if you take any part of her away from the islands and uh, curse you, basically, give you bad luck. And I talked to a couple of people about it just to see. And Mary Beth, was, uh, she told us her story that they actually get quite a bit of lava rock and sand in the mail back from tourists that have come and, and taken it and brought it, you know, have had really bad luck and sent it back. Oh, so, wow. Even her sister had had a streak of very bad luck when she had brought home a little vial of sand or something. And, uh, you know, two weeks later, she said, I got the, I got the vial of sand back. <laughs> Please go put this back on the beach. <laughs> oh. So I bought a beautiful ornament. It was a beautiful ornament about this big. I paid $25 US for it. It was, it was handmade. I like to buy stuff that artists make there and stuff. Yeah. Like where I go. So anyhow... One of the, one of the things was it was really beautiful. It was a sort of a, a finger painted scene with the moon and the the skyline and the beach and the water and 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 he had actually used real sand for the beach, and and after we got looking at it, like yeah, no, that's that's lava sand. I I, I gotta leave this. Here. <laughs> I, <took> that off. <laughs> I left it there. I just <laughs> don't need bad luck. <laughs> what an experience, Tim. Yeah, Amanda's right. like. 
Should I check my shoes before we yeah, leave? I was going to say, yeah, check, <laughs> check your fingernails and everything, eh? Put your feet up in the air. Yeah. So when's the documentary out, Tim? So the documentary is coming out on um, June 3rd. Okay. And the station is AMI Tele. So it's in French. Um, they're working on an English version, uh, subtitled. I said if they want to do the English version, I could do it all again in English if they want. But <laughs> <laughs> all from Hawaii, though, this time. All from Hawaii this time. Yeah, so um, that'll be at 7 p.m. Atlantic time, I believe. So if you have Bell 5, Fiber Up, um, I think the channel's 8, uh, 812. But I'll be posting, um, you know, a link to the different things coming up shortly. So awesome. Okay. All right. Yeah. No. I think I saw a clip. I think I saw a preview. Uh, did you have a teaser or something up on your page a little while back? Yeah, there was a. They hired somebody from Quebec to. He's an artist. Um, yeah, he's playing guitar. He came and uh, came to the observatory, um, and experienced the the experience and with with the group of students and um and he wrote a song and That's they it. did a video oh nice awesome. yeah it's on your page there so to share that later on that's yeah. awesome tim congratulations buddy thanks a lot and uh we're getting geared up now for the summer we're right. opening up june 1st for the, the nocturnal sky theater we've got some new telescopes and uh we actually have another 16 inch telescope coming so wow. um, I bought one from another friend from Moncton who wanted to get rid of it. So, um, he sold it to me cheap. And yeah, uh, you got more glass now you had in your whole life. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I think I'm getting close to number of uh, telescopes that to the number of glasses I've actually owned. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. <laughs> we don't count them all. That's yeah, that's awesome, Tim. Thanks so much, buddy. Thanks for filling yeah. us in on everything that happened. It was looked like it was an awesome time. Oh yeah, that's uh, it was. Uh, if we can bring on three extra suitcases. We can all get in those next time around. Yeah, yeah that's right. Well, that means <laughs> I have to leave two cameras behind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, um, so we'll watch out for that, Tim. You're going to put a link up for that. Yeah. And that comes available, and I'll I'll be sharing it on my page, so I'll let everybody know. Take a look at it for it. So yeah, we're looking forward to it. it. Should be fun. That's fantastic. You, uh, you, you're. Uh, we're living vicariously through you. Yeah. <laughs> all of these things that you're doing and all the places you're going and yeah. all these experiences. This is uh, this is a, a dream come true for for anybody. Oh, yeah. and and during our conversation with the film with the uh, film uh, the owners of the film company. Um, I had mentioned, I said, wouldn't it be really cool to have a documentary uh, with, you know, visiting all the telescopes of the world and, you know, talking about them, giving their history and stuff. And and they were actually quite taken on that too. So. Oh, no. Yes, sir. <laughs> Wait for the phone to ring. <laughs> that lava rock stuff there, all of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I sent her a message and I said, uh, I said, if, uh, if you guys ever do decide to do that, you know that that dog, that idea I had. You know, basically, I said, uh, just uh, just give me a shout. I said, I'm always willing for a career change. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a big one. Yeah, that would be an amazing thing to do, wouldn't it? Absolutely, I yeah. would definitely not say no to that. No, for sure. Well, envy you for sure, Tim. Nice stuff, buddy. We're so happy for you, every one of us. Yeah, absolutely. If it couldn't be us. We were glad it was you. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll wait for the uh, for the teaser trailer. Oh, I'll send up the teaser trailer once uh, once I see it back on your page, and I'll uh, yeah. I'll wait for your link, and then we'll we'll share that for sure. Awesome. Forward to it. Looking forward to the English English version. I have to get somebody to translate for me. Yeah, it's supposed to. They're they're working on it. It it might come. It might not. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we could always link up with you, and you can translate it for us. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Awesome. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Another show. <laughs> I'll be back on the show. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Tim. Um, so how about we go to a, uh, we're running for time, Ooh, 8.51. Um, we're going to go ahead with the Bino Bud? We'll oh, carry on. We can give you a Bino Bud if you want one. Yep. Sure. I get all, I get all night. All right, we should see uh, we did. knocking our target of the week. 
by Bun on Bud this week is, and because there's a lunar Chris is doing a shoot moon contest, guess what? Our target of the week is <laughs> the moon. <laughs> I can't miss that with a pair of binoculars, right? <laughs> So oh, the moon is the Earth's only proper natural satellite at one quarter of the diameter of the Earth compared to the width of Australia. Actually, it's the largest natural satellite in the solar system relative to the size of its planet and the fifth largest satellite in the solar system overall. Orbiting Earth at an average lunar distance of 384,000 kilometers or 283,900 miles, about 30 times the Earth's diameter, its gravitational influence is the main driver for the Earth's tides and uh, slightly lengthens the Earth's day. The moon is classified as a planetary mass object and lacks any significant atmosphere, hydrosphere, or magnetic field. So how do I find it in the sky? I always love this part. <laughs> if you went out tonight <laughs> and the clouds moved out of the way, oriented yourself at 9 o'clock uh, at 195 degrees south of west, look up, you will see the moon right underneath Leo. It's going to be an awesome sight tonight if you can get around those clouds because it's really starting to brighten up. She's approximately 58% illuminated in waxing gibbous mode. So it looks like it's about half. So it's an awesome target to look at. What would you see when you look at it? Well, you'll see the Terminator line, which is right there. You'll see seas and, or mirrors, and you'll see lots and lots of craters with a pair of binoculars. In 10 by 50s, this is what it's going to look like. So it's a pretty big size. You can't miss it. You know, it's the only bright object up in that corner of the sky in, in Leo. And the disadvantage <laughs> of the going to the moon. <laughs> so that was binocular target of the week. I find a button. Awesome. I unshare. <clears throat> Thanks, Mike. That's a different one. That's a, yeah, that's a tough one to find, but I'm glad you put it out. It's going to be sky. difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, are there, are there subtitles in that one, Tim? There won't be, will there? No, yes. No. Uh, yeah, okay. That might be a possibility. That might be easier. Yeah. Okay, let's go with what's up then maybe next. Um, I'll uh, share my screen. We're going to go with uh, this one, I think. Oh, I'm going to go, oh, I'm gonna go there. Stop share. Hang on. Here we go. La, 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 la. <laughs> I think it is that screen. Hang on. Uh, here. I'm going to go from slideshow from the beginning, I think. There you uh, go. That work? Yep. yep. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, what's up this week? A little quick look at what's up this week. Uh, of course, if you take a look at heavensabove.com, uh, this site offers us a nice view of planets looking down on top of, of the solar system. So we would be this one right here, that's us. Uh, Mercury and Venus are uh, right there. Uh, if we take a look at this drawing and try to follow it through and knowing that everything goes counterclockwise around the sun and we rotate counterclockwise as we go around the sun, uh, it helps to determine, for me anyway, it helps me determine what's up uh, in the evening sky or the morning sky based on that drawing, but you can go take a look for yourself. I'm not gonna to get too long into it. Um, anyway, to, uh, to look at the whole drawing, uh, we can look at this chart, which is a handy chart on uh, under that site, uh, planet summary. So on this right now, we can see that Mercury is low in the morning sky just after daybreak. So here we are with Mercury rises at 454 right now. Uh, Venus is still bright in our evening sky and will remain that way until about July. So uh, it's rising at 8.48 in the morning, but it doesn't set until midnight. It's still a nice uh, minus 4.2, very bright. Mars is a dim object in our evening sky, <clears throat> getting a lot smaller. Um, it's only at 1.6 brightness, so that's pretty dim. Uh, you can tell that it's Mars because it's a nice reddish glow, but that's about all. Jupiter rises about an hour before daybreak. Uh, Here's 417, and it sets at 1749. So it's not long enough in the evening sky yet for us to catch the evening sky yet. Uh, and it's not at opposition, opposition this year until November. So we're not, the sun, earth, and Jupiter aren't lined up until November. So we've got a lot of time to enjoy uh, Jupiter right into the fall and part of the winter, I guess. Uh, Saturn rises before Jupiter around 230, and it's not at opposition until the end of August. So we still have some really nice viewing at the end of the summer for those two uh, fancy planets there. 
which are the ones that uh, kind of steal the show. Um, all week long, uh, Jupiter and Saturn are in their morning sky. So if you're an early riser, you may want to check out the Ring Beauty Saturn along with the giant planet Jupiter before sunrise. Now, Saturn rises around 2.30. It should be in good viewing position before sunrise. Jupiter doesn't rise until about 4.30, just about a half hour before sunrise. So it's more difficult to spot, but not possible. Try it with binoculars, but put your binoculars away when you see the sun coming up. Um, all week long, the naked uh, eye evening planets. Now, our evening sky continues to present brilliant Venus and Gemini. Well, much, the much dimmer red planet Mars rests in Cancer. Uh, Venus will continue to be our evening star until about the end of July. It will be some time before we have another great view of Mars, though. Tomorrow morning, uh, Mercury is at the greatest western elongation, um, or the farthest west that it can appear in our morning sky in its 88-day orbit around the sun. It would be very difficult to pick out Mercury tomorrow with the glare of morning sunrise on its way, but it will be better for viewing in about a week or so. Um, <clears throat> Sunday, uh, we have Venus at greatest east, uh, western elongation next Sunday. Uh, Venus reaches greatest western elongation or the farthest, I'm sorry, I should say east, farthest east that it can reach in our sky. Uh, after that, Venus will start to appear a bit lower in the sky each evening at the same time until it disappears from our evening view around mid-July. And this guy is kind of nice. So uh, all week long, uh, Mars near or in the Beehive Cluster, M44. So all week, look for the red planet Mars as it nears, and then greets the Beehive Cluster or Messier 44 in the constellation of Cancer. The Beehive Cluster is a beautiful open star cluster of about a thousand stars, easily visible with binoculars. Now, open star clusters are stars that are gravitationally bound and are created out of the same star forming nebula, such as the stars in the Orion Nebula. The Beehive is one of the nearest open star clusters to our Sun and Earth. It has a large population of stars, uh, larger than uh, most other nearby clusters. The Beehive's distance is about 577 light years from our solar system. It's really pretty in binoculars. Uh, go from there to look, look at what we got for the ISS passing over this week. Just a couple few passes uh, this week, tomorrow night, or actually tonight at uh, 1030. We have a pass uh, begins in the west northwest at 2225 at Linacon. Its highest point is in the southwest at 2229, um, just underneath the moon, actually. And then it ends in the south southeast at 2231. Uh, might not catch it tonight with a cloudy sky here locally. But tomorrow night, there's another nice pass. Uh, it's going to begin in the west northwest at 2137, uh, the highest point in the south southwest at 2140. And then it ends uh, in the southeast at 2144. So nice long pass there, 2137, 2144, seven minute pass. Like that one last night, Paul. Yes, that's right. It was a long one. <clears throat> mm. uh, so next Sunday is the full strawberry moon. Uh, that will arrive either on Saturday, June 3rd or Sunday, June 4th, depending on where you live. Now, for us in the Maritimes, the moon turns full at 1241 a.m. on the 4th and rises in east-southeast at 1022 p.m. that evening. We have four supermoons on the way, but we have to wait until July for the first one. Still, the moon will look very brilliant and big at the horizon, whether or not the supermoon is taking place. And sunset will take place at around 8.33, which should make the moon rise even more dramatic. So watch for that one next Sunday. Ah, back to our contest. So we have a contest going on now. I've mentioned it a number of times, a moon contest. Uh, open to all ages. Um, you can send your entries into astronomybythebay at gmail.com. I'd like to get them all to go there. And I'm getting quite a few now. Lots of the child entries uh, or kids entries in the last couple of days. Really great. Now the contest closes at midnight on June the 5th. Um, the draw takes place on, here on the show uh, on the June 11th uh, program. And a special thanks to Cliff Valley Astronomy and Stefan there for their sponsorship for our contest. So lots of prizes here for the adults. Uh, the children's ones are child telescopes, a couple of uh, prizes there, and some uh, constellation books, a couple of games. So for the adults, you take a picture, a new picture of the moon, uh, send it into astronomybythebay at gmail.com. I don't, not, none of it is being judged. Just your photo gets put in the draw, and it's a random selection. For the children, uh, 12 and under, I'm asking them to draw a picture of what they might see if they were looking through a telescope. So I've had Jupiter and Saturn, and I've had uh, aliens on the moon. And I've had alien, I even had an alien uh, flying a UFO, picking, uh, zooming up a piece of pizza. <laughs> so I've had all kinds of uh, pretty neat, uh, pretty neat drawings. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing more of those. So that's uh, that ends again on June the fifth. So hoping to get more entries in for that one. 
Uh, Lisa's lookup, Lisa Fanning uh, puts out this great chart every month for us. Um, the chart has the events listed in the first column. Second column is the dates of the events. Then we have the peak times, when's the best time to look for that event. And then your seeing tools. Do you need naked eye, binoculars, or a telescope? And uh, you can download that chart at Lisa's page, at uh, Lisa's lookup at Ruby Moonbeams on Instagram, Twitter, Mastodon, and Facebook. And for us locally here, St. John Astronomy Club and the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the, the New Brunswick chapter, puts out this calendar every month. Kurt Mason puts this out. It's a six-week calendar, and this one takes us right up to June 17th, right up to the first entire party of the year, which is at the Kujibakrak National Park, right there on the 17th. Uh, so this calendar can be downloaded there and gives us all the things that are happening throughout the weeks. And that's what we get to say for this week. What's up? <clears throat> <laughs> anyway, we'll stop sharing. Okay, we're back. Oh, oh, we're back. Yeah, we're back. All right. We're back. Okay, um, how about a Rosanna's fun fact next? Paul? Yeah, we can do that. All right, just one sec here. Let me see if I can't share this screen. See if we can make it happen, number one. And this is this week's. Rosanna's fun fact. Welcome back, Rosanna, for another absolutely fun fact for this week. And uh, this one's, as usual, not only is it fun, but it's also very interesting and educational. So let's get started. So Rosanna writes, hi, Paul, a bit like the friend who wears a lampshade at parties, Mars is the planet of the party of the week. Quoting from Kurt's Sky at a Glance, Mars is the center of attention this week, appearing as a garnet gem amongst the stars of the Beehive Cluster M44 on Thursday and Friday, the evenings before and after, it will be just on the outskirts of the cluster. Mars is actually a hot topic and will be until 2029, the projected date of when the humans are expected to land on Mars. The complexity of such a mission is overwhelming to think about but hundreds of people are working on solving every imaginable aspect of sending humans to Mars, not just to visit, but to actually live there. Now, first off, how to get rid of the body. That's <laughs> funny. <laughs> One division of research is being dedicated to what to do if an, astronaut, if an astronaut dies when on Mars, or in the case of permanent settlement, it's simply when a person dies. First off, you need a tissue digester. <laughs> is for the text to just transfer the body into an empty pod and seal the lid. It will be filled with water spiked with potassium hydroxide, which is a caustic base. The pod is then heated to 300 degrees Fahrenheit and pressurized to 70 uh, uh, PSI, and after about 12 hours of pressure cooking alkaline hydrolysis, the pod will be drained, leaving only the bones behind. The broth will be piped into the colony's uh, aerobic digester, where microorganisms will break down the biodegradable waste to produce methane gas that will fuel spacecraft and other vehicles. The remaining liquid becomes fertilizer along with the bones, which are heat dried and crushed into a nitrogen and mineral rich powder. Nitrogen is a key component of chlorophyll and will be a valuable addition to the fertilizer to grow Martian crops. Any remaining solids will be transferred to compost bins to eventually form um, uh, uh, build materials like walls, decks, planks, and particle boards even a uh, molecule will be reused and will be uh, and will be there will be sorry no landfills on Mars. Which researching tissue digesters ads came up for the microwave digester? Whoops, I, did I miss a picture? I did. Uh oh. Okay, uh, let me see if I can make this happen. I know what was there is one sec. Bear with me. 
Oh yeah, it's there. It should be up. And I'm not sure where it got to. Just one sec. I'll see if I can find it. There it is. No, that's the digester. That's not what I was looking for. No, it didn't make it. Okay, give me one sec. Let's save images. Uh, that one was what? Number six. So we'll go to number, uh, we'll say seven. Oop, there it is. Okay, now let me just grab that for you. Oops. Where did it go? Good go. It's there. There it is. There's the microwave. Okay, so <clears throat> so um, the microwave digestion with with or without acid added is commonly used to prepare a variety of samples from food and agriculture to metals, ceramics and mining, anything in between. I can get a tabletop version for forty nine hundred and eighty dollars on sale and financing is available. <laughs> note, note its name Mars. Not sure what I would do with this if I was to get one. So the theory of how to get rid of the body seems plausible and certainly sounds more productive than the old way, which was, let me find it. There it is. The best place to hide a dead body is page two of Google search results. <laughs> <laughs> Before the astronaut dies, they must be well nourished. They will make better fertilizer that way. Researchers have recently developed a salad that not only is most nutritionally balanced, but is also has the easiest ingredients to grow on a spacecraft or in a space world garden. The trip to Mars will only be possible if fresh food can be grown on the journey. And I think there is the plate there. So here it is and you can make this yourself at home of course it would have kale the salad consists of seven ingredients soybeans poppy seeds barley kale peanuts sunflower seeds and sweet potatoes all in carefully measured amounts that can be grown in small enclosures on a spacecraft and fulfill the nutritional needs of astronauts on the long duration trips so in case you were thinking yay a road trip <laughs> <laughs> nope. Nope. <laughs> First edge is grown, never harvest and eaten in space. Nope. It's going to be like this over and over and over. <laughs> that is this week's Rosanna's Fun Fact. <laughs> oh, that, well, is that was an interesting topic. <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> I never and, really thought about humans dying on Mars and what was going to happen to them afterwards. Well, you know, now we know what's going to happen now to we know. bodies, unlike here where we just plunk them in the ground. Well, not only do you eat them, but you can go for a walk on them, too, after you build a deck. <laughs> well, not, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, boy. Okay. I that was interesting. I two by four. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, thank you, Rosanna. That thank was you, Rosanna. Uh, as usual, not only an interesting, but definitely fun fact. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, uh got a few photos to share, and then we're gonna sign off right after that. So let's uh take a look at my photos. Da, 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 da. I think we put them over here, and I think this one's gonna open up. We'll see like, this up first pop, of all. Papa Pringles. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here. Should be us. There we go. There, okay. We got uh, this is from Jeff Pendleberry. Jeff says, following images were shot on May the 24th at 10 p.m. Uh, I saw a plane coming into the field of view, so set exposure time to eight seconds to try and, and get a trail. Uh, the ISO 500, uh, F4.8, and 112 millimeter. So we did get it. Awesome shot. Nice yeah. job. Well done. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. And we have a picture here from Emma. Everybody knows Emma. Oh, what you call you? The Timinator. I think she said uh, earlier there she was posting up, Tim. <laughs> Timinator. <laughs> Timinator. Uh, Emma says, uh, yeah, I was eating ice cream on the waterfront and the moon waiting for darkness at 3.30 p.m. on Saturday. So there you go, Emma. Always looking up. Good for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, we'll get these couple from Brad Perry. 
Brad always sends us some nice shots. Uh, he says, hi, Chris, sharing a couple of images taken during a recent camping trip to Mount Carlton. Hey, uh, oh, these, yes. these are both taken on May the 22nd between 1 a.m. and 2.30 a.m. He said, now, the most interesting thing was that these two views were happening at the exact same time and location. This other view is here. He says, I only had to rotate my tripod 180 degrees. Aurora to the north, Milky Way to the south, and not a cloud in sight. Wow. After getting rained out on the previous night, this was certainly an evening I won't forget. And that's the thing about Mount Carlton, isn't it? It's yeah, either yeah. pour and rain yeah. or it's yeah. beautiful yeah. like this. How many times have we experienced that? Uh, yeah, that's the nice amazing job. sky. But yeah. nice, wow. nice, the nicest skies in the province right there. Look, look yeah. at the Prince of Pony. Oh, yeah, I can see it all. Prince of Pony. It's, it, it looks like the water was probably a little rough that night. Uh, the long exposures would have uh, smoothed it out. Yeah, you don't see any stars in there, so chances are the water was a little rough. What's going here? Is this uh, something on the camera? Is that a that might be a satellite going across? It looks like an artifact of some sort. Yeah, one it's side of the road. other side of the Milky Way. Beautiful. Yeah, it's in both of them. Very nice. Yeah, nice beautiful, done, Brad. beautiful images. Thanks for those. Um, next up is Matthew Dupre. Matthew sent this one in. Nice so shot. Like, just got uh, finished editing this from last night. This is about two hours on the Saturn region of in sync and but sick. Butterfly nebula. <laughs> there you go. Uh in sync was taken with a T3 camera and a Celestron nine and a quarter HD and hyperstar. Well done, Matthew. Yeah, Very well done. Yeah. Yeah, that's a nice detail there. Okay, I'm going to go from there to uh, Lisa Fanning, who sent me this one about the, with the moon. She says, hi, Chris, here's my entry for the moon contest, taken back on the 25th from Keyport, New Jersey. New Jersey. New Jersey. New Jersey. Oh, wait, no luck, she says, no luck at, the, at night these days with clear sky, so here's the almost full, full first quarter moon taken in the evening. So, Nice, nice. shot. Nice shot. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, post here from Kathy Adams. Oh, it's nice. Uh, yeah. Nice uh, Tuesday night's moon. Yes, raccoons were involved again, she said. <laughs> <laughs> raccoons. <laughs> Poor Kathy. It's always an adventure. Raccoon moon. Yep. Uh, this one from uh, Chris Benoit. Nice shot of the sun. Boy, yes, sir. Boy that's active. It is. Wow. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Unbelievable. Unreal. And we've got a larger one there now. I think 3115 is about 10 times the size of the Earth. Wow. Uh, which may be throwing off some players here very soon. I think that's it there. That's David Hoskins says today's sun and the moon. Yeah, so there's the there's the 3315 one there. What's the size of that? Or giant. And I actually see that at sunset. If you've got a little bit of filtered sky, you can actually see that. Yeah. Take it out. You don't want to look at it very long, of course, but camera for sure. And here's his moonshot today. Nice. Makes it done. Yes, sir. Well, Pat Terrio has a dwarf lab, he says. Uh, he says, still have a lot to learn about pro post-processing, but I'm getting there slowly. So we see what that dwarf lab um, system does. It's just like a camera mounted on a mount and does all the stacking. And oh, it's getting lots of data there. It's good. Yeah. Well done, Bill. Yes, sir. Well, you're, you'll get there, Pat. Indeed. All right. Yep. And from there, I'm going to go to... Uh, this picture from Jade Kelly. She is eight years old, and she said, "Here's my entry uh, from my niece. Uh, actually, Lauren Kelly, her uh, aunt, said, here's the entry from my niece Jade, made for the kids contest. She's eight years old.' Wow! Look at that! Hey, eh? look at the detail there. Yeah. Yeah. There's and so that. much in there. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you look at that, there's the sun and all the planets, right? Around. Yeah. This is the kind of stuff I'm getting on as uh, as entries. They're just fantastic. I'm loving the, the drawings. Just yeah. oh, it's, it's every time I open one up, I start to laugh. It's just like, like I really you know, the only it. thing missing there is Pluto, eh? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's drawing. just in the dark right now. There you yeah, go. That's, that's all. It. That's all. Yeah. Just hiding. Oh, I'm getting oh, reached out of face when we see these pictures like this. That's awesome. So being occulted by something. Thank that's you, Jay. Right. You're now entered in the contest. So yeah. Beautiful work. Well done. And Mr. Owen was talking a little bit oh, earlier about yeah. Star Trails. Hey, look at that. There you yeah. go. I, I was uh, I, I was I was going back in time the other night when I saw that EI, the ISS. Yeah. And I decided, well, I'm going to go out and do a Star Trail. I haven't done one since I started astrophotography. I thought, I'm going to go do one just to see if you remember how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of 
have better tools nowadays. It's really slick. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Tim, it's beautiful because the camera has the interval on or built right into it. So yeah. all you got to do is just like, you know, just put the camera on the pod, get it in focus, set it up, and just basically uh, press two or three buttons. And I went back in and watched a movie. <laughs> that was wonderful. That's actually it. Yeah, if you look at the uh, if you look at the uh, the song from the trailer of the of the documentary, you'll see mine in there. Oh, awesome! Right. Can you do some trails? Yeah, and mine's animated. Yes, oh, sir. Awesome! Oh, awesome! Look forward to it. But yeah, it was That's a nice night. In matter of fact, Tristan was talking about that. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, it just, the night was so beautiful. It was so calm and. Oh. Yeah. Oh, what a night to be out. Turned out really well. Yeah, it was. Got some nice nights this week coming up. Uh, I had a beautiful night last night. It looks like a couple coming up after this. Well, you know what? Here's a plan, Chris. I mean, and we can put this out to the people. If they want to see how to do this, I'm actually working on a whole uh, uh, process of how to do these star trails in very deep. So I can do one on the show and then have everybody go out and try to get to capture some star trails. That'd be awesome. Yeah, great. Because the trip to this stuff isn't this this is easy to do the trick is to get a cool foreground and start playing with it make it really creative right that, that'll be the fun part so this was just right. something I did in my backyard but i'm going to start now hunting for cool things to actually do star trails in front of yeah so, awesome yeah, well yeah. we'll look forward to you to bringing in bringing it ahead paul should be yeah, fun because do. it's something everybody can do right absolutely yeah Okay, if you have photos that you'd like to share, we'd love to get them. So you can send them into uh, strongbythebay at gmail.com and we'd love to have them on our next broadcast. So thanks very much for everybody. And I think we're going to close out our show tonight. I guess it's probably enough time. Uh, so in closing on tonight, we'd like to thank uh, our friend Tim Doucette for joining us again this evening. Tim, it was thank a great you pleasure to have you back on the show. Uh, please come back and join us in the future. Absolutely. Keep us posted on what's going on with the documentary. I'll be watching your page and you can send me a link and I'll share it with everybody once it's, once it's up. So well, thank you. Let, us, let us know what you're charging for autographs too down the way. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> we, we're, we're going down to Nova Scotia this weekend. So I'm not sure if we're going down the shore or not, but if we do, we'll come knocking. Come yeah. knocking. You know where I am. We're going to come visit you soon. A special thanks again to uh, for all of your support out there. Of course, a special thanks to Rosanna for her continued contributions to the show. Rosanna, thank you for another interesting topic. That was that was a different one. I'm gonna go oh, back awesome. and that one again. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. I'd like to know where you get all this stuff. We <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, really do appreciate it. Also, a special thanks goes out to Trudy, uh, Indy Storm Weather Center, all those folks out there that share our our, uh, our post for us. We very appreciate it, Emma as well. Uh, we also uh, hope that all of you who joined us from Rogers uh, this evening enjoyed the program. If you'd like more information about the wonders of the night sky, you can find me at astronomybythebay.ca. Uh, remember, too, we do love getting your photos, so send them in to astronomybythebay at gmail.com, and we'll be happy to include them on our next broadcast. And now we have four more weeks left before we take a summer break. Uh, so if you have any ideas for what you'd like to see us discuss over the next four weeks, please let us know. Send them into the same address, and we'll try our best to make it happen. One week's going to be Star Trails, for sure. That's picked out already. So yep. please let your friends and family know, too, that we'll be back here next Sunday night at 8 p.m. on YouTube and Facebook to edutain you on astronomy and the wonders of the night sky. So for now, then, from Tim, Mike, Paul, and myself, wish you a safe week, everybody. Lots of clear skies, hopefully. Got a couple of days coming up. They're going to be clear. As we like to say, open your eyes to view the skies and keep your scopes. Point it up. Good night, everyone. Good night.